what we do is a risky job. You know, there are times that we will go out those doors and we might not always be coming back in the same condition we left. Death, I suppose, was the first thing that was hard for me. One colleague of mine had a lot of things going on in a private life and just one small thing on the ward triggered everything off and I actually had to get the crisis team on the ward there and then to assess her because she was at risk of hurting herself. I had what I can only call a breakdown. Um, I planned, planned how I was going to do it, when I was going to do it. We are what I would class as the last port of call for anybody. And for us to come away from somewhere thinking, actually, we couldn't do anything there, is quite, well, it's, it's heart-wrenching. When I say emergency services, I think of danger, panic, and worry, but I also feel safe. These are the people who are going to save us, help us, and rescue us. What I don't think is that they need to be saved. One in four emergency workers have poor mental health because of their job. I want to find out what hides in the minds of our heroes. What hides behind the blue lights? I'm Bethany Elsie and I live with mental health issues, often finding simple everyday tasks difficult. So I struggle to understand how those who see traumatic situations every day cope. My mum's a staff nurse and will be featured in this documentary because I've seen how the stress of the job can push someone to breaking point. I want to find others who have been in her situation and share their stories. I did hit rock bottom and then come back up quite quickly. Yeah, I had to, didn't have a choice. Yeah, there's some sad cases that do stick in your mind. Um, a young girl who died at 26 after not long giving birth to a lovely little boy had suffered from Crohn's um, for quite a few years and obviously the hormone imbalance of being pregnant and giving birth brought on cancer. Out. There was no cure for and she she died screaming that she didn't want to die. It was horrific. You don't look after yourself when you're at work. I could do a seven and a half hour shift and not have a drink of water past my lips and not go to the toilet once. The responsibility that you have with the resources that you have is beyond a joke at times. So not only emotionally can it affect you, it can actually affect you physically because you're so busy you can't look after yourself on the ward. I'm on my way to go and speak to Scott Forward at Durham and Darlington Fire and Rescue Service. As the crew manager for the team there, I'd really like to speak to him about the daily stresses of the job and how his team cope. We are getting stretched to our limits, like, really are. What we see in a car crash and things like that is not difficult for us to deal with because that's, we knew we would do that when we joined. We knew we would get the, the, the blood, the guts, the gore, stuff like that. We knew we'd get that. You can come away from a car accident thinking, actually, you know what it is, I did my utmost and, and, and I couldn't do more. When you go into someone's house and you see burns that are clearly neglected, uh, I haven't been washed for days, nappies bulging at the seams, and you think, actually, I'm powerless over that. I'll, I'll, I hold my hat up to the paramedics because you'll sit and you'll sit with somebody for an hour while the ambulance comes and they'll, they'll, they'll pour the heart out about. Um, as an example, the last one I went to, the, the lady had, husband had dementia, and I, this sounds horrible, he was sitting waiting to die. It's stuff like that that, 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 that we can't deal, well, I can't deal with. The uniform that has seen tragic loss and survival, just as our heroes have. Something firefighter Kev knows all too well. Can you describe to me one particular event that has stayed with you? Uh, to be honest, I, I've worked in the West End 12 years. Um, I've seen an absolute myriad of horrible things from, you know, from people dying in the night, elderly people at the, or, uh, the 
the family outside and then having to force entry and it's sometimes that's not pleasant especially being a few days and then trying to show a little bit of dignity and respect for the family. People committing suicide, jumping off bridges, people getting caught up machinery. Sometimes it just seems a futile waste and a silly loss of life and, and there's nothing you can do about it. And um, yeah. I mean, they, they talk a lot, a lot of times about um, how your brain copes with seeing something traumatic and you know, you, 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 your eyes take in a lot and then you'll get snapshots later down, later down in time of, of that particular incident. It might be a smell or a sight that will give you a little flash of something. And over time you become conditioned to it so it stays with you. It doesn't go away, it, 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 but it doesn't sort of come back as often. I've seen my fair share of things and, and yes, they stay with me, you know, you know, to the end of time as far as I'm concerned. I can still remember stuff from the day I started and it does stay with you. You know, people who say it doesn't you know, lie, a lie. That they, they, you know, seeing something horrible, you know, will always leave its mark. I'm going to speak to a man whose service within the police force came to a crashing end. After working as an officer for over two decades and witnessing uncountable traumas. It was being surrounded by death that impacted Bryn to extremes. My first proper day in the job was a night shift and I turned up for work, oh, there's been a fatal air crash. I thought, oh, fatal air crash? And, uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect. And this guy came up to me, who was a colleague, have you seen a dead body yet, son? And he pulled the sheet off this still bubbling corpse and to be honest, at 22 years old, that was the first job I'd been put in now, I was absolutely kicking it. Death was almost a daily occurrence. You know, there was no, uh, no sort of lessons on how to deal with, with coming to terms with that. Yeah, I think death, I suppose, was the first thing that was hard for me. But hangings were, were quite commonplace. And, and one such hanging where we attended and I wasn't allowed to cut the, cut, cut the, 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 sort of the young girl down um, for, for procedural reasons, but I still wanted to do it. I think there, there was a long delay. So my issue was I was having to skirt around this person every few seconds because it was right next to the front door. Her family kept coming to the door and looking through the opaque glass window they could see the, the shape which they knew was the, the daughter hanging there, you know. Um, and that, that, that affected me quite badly, and I, I, I was quite angry about that and made, made me protest at, back at work. Being a staff nurse is far harder than I ever imagined it to be. When it's your own and I've cared for my granda when he had cancer and I'm caring for my grand now who was basically just dying of old age. Take your time, you can, you do it every day. Um, and then having a few comorbidities along the way, stroke, heart failure and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Every day you're doing well. You lose sleep over that, that's different. I think sometimes when things go wrong, the pressure um, to perform, get everything right every time, can be quite tough. It can be quite a difficult, stressful job at times, yeah. You know, people have, you know, months, years to analyse your decisions you may have to make in a split second, you know, maybe in the middle of the night, maybe with people screaming at you. What I don't understand is how in a job where death is so common, when diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, people like Bryn find such a lack of support. Uh, Again, it was it was down to the, the, the stigma attached to, to anything, anybody with mental health was basically ridiculed at work anyway. You were offered support within the police. Yes. Um, budget cuts meant that she left. Yeah. What were you left with? Nothing. 
where I thought I was going to lose my life, you just you went back to work. You know, there was, a, was you sort of your pals and your supervision would pat you on the back. Um, there was no no follow up to any of that, so I, I was just sort of left. You know, and I I, I didn't know what to do, um, and, and I, I started to lose the ability to, to function, you know, it just sort of seemed, I, I didn't know what I was doing, it, it was just very strange feelings. I'd be woken up suddenly, and or even during the day, you know, so you, you, you're doing something and you just get this intrusion of seeing a face, it might be somebody you've just recognised in the street, and it would just take you back and it would just be a, an awful dark place that you went to. Emergency service workers witness trauma on a daily basis, but for some, it's too much. What is it that allows some to cope and others to break? I'm on my way to Taunton in Somerset to meet a firefighter who was almost pushed past his limits. Do you think there's, there's pressure to kind of be the tough guy and keep it all together when really you might be struggling? Yeah, absolutely. There is... Um... I think there's still that pressure, that um, that label that we're kind of meant to be strong and, and just get on with the job, um, but that doesn't always happen. Sorry if this question is too blunt. No. But have you ever tried to kill yourself? Um, I haven't tried literally. Um, there was, there's been. Um, had a really good day um, and, and this kind of just shows how my moods can fluctuate from one to the other. I had a really good, amazing day in London, come back on the train, um, I had what I can only call a breakdown um, and I just thought something just clicked and I just thought this is it, I've, I've got to go. I didn't know if I had any intentions, I think I just wanted someone to talk to. So I stood, it goes, I stood on the correct side of the bridge. Um, and this was sort of getting on by one o'clock in the morning by this time. Um, thinking someone's going to think, why is he stood out this time of night? They'll stop and talk to me. I stood there for 10, 15 minutes, nobody did. Um, so I thought the only way of getting any contact was by stepping over the railings, which I did. Um, and within minutes, somebody came up and spoke to me. Um, and then I looked around and I was sort of surrounded by police and ambulance and, and all the rest of it. Um, I think I was more ashamed of myself, or more... I don't know how to explain it, really. It was more... Um, I just wanted that feeling to go. The amount of times I said to myself, what, what is happening to me? What is going on? And, and now I kind of... Part of me kicks myself about it, but then the other part kind of understands it. But at the time, I didn't think even of my children. Had I done anything, um, it, the effect it would have had on them would have been immense. Um, Through speaking to these people, I'm amazed that despite working beyond their limits and their daily struggles, they have found ways to cope. They have hope that things do get better and that saving lives every day helps to save themselves. How are you diddling? Good. Aye, plod on, plod on. For me, I just, this is where I feel safe. Uh, I, I know that I can do my job. I know that. I'm good at my job, I know that I can help people um, and it's just that ability because I know for a fact every time I come in here generally nine times out of ten I can enhance somebody's life. I do struggle sometimes outside of work but when I get to work as soon as I walk through them doors that's me back into Scott Forward, crew manager, Red Watch and it's great. advice I would give that everybody's different and everybody hand, handles situations completely different. But there is help out there if you want help, whether it be from a family member, a work colleague or a professional, there is help out there and, and seek it because every day is a new day. Yes, I'm back to running and that's made a massive difference. Are you actually going to work and people say, oh, you look great, you look really well, and I think it is because I've started running again. 
try and speak with some of the colleagues, if it, somebody that they trust and somebody that's not going to take the mic out of them, basically. So your advice is to talk, just yeah. not be afraid to talk. Yeah, don't, don't, you know, let it all out. It's the best thing that you can do is, is, is open up to it because until you do that, you'll never ever be able to process the, the bad things that's going on in your head. If you've got a colleague that, that you think something's not right, no matter how big or small it, it might feel, um, then kind of question them or ask them or, or take them away for five minutes or just do that one thing because it could help um, a massive change in the future for them. Uh, as I always say, I still have good days and bad days, um, but generally it's, it's all good. Um, I'm working as normal, see my children, um, socialising, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of things that I did sort of years ago that I never have done since, since I've been ill. Um, and that's a massive pleasure for me and makes me a lot happier. You know, you just try to talk about it, it without sounding like a cliche. You do talk about it a little bit initially and you know, you put it to the back of your mind and you carry on for the next thing. And there's no greater feeling than coming out of an incident away thinking that you've done something good and helped someone. We are sort of humans at the end of the day and, and we are sensitive.